This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is The Citadel Cafe, episode number 429 for Wednesday, January 12th, 2022. My name is Joel Duggan and The Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. Joining me this week, Lou Page is back after the holidays, at Busy Zombie Lord on all the social media that matters, and co-host of Zombies Ate My Podcast. Hello, Lou. Howdy. Been a while. It has been a while. And speaking of a while, uh, has Zamp returned to the podcasting waves in 2022 as of yet? It has not. We did our last show mid-December, and we're going to be recording our next episode tomorrow. So the goal is tomorrow's episode, we're going to talk about zombies from last year, like all the new stuff that that happened last year, and we're going to talk about the stuff that's coming in the new year. Cool. There's surprisingly a lot of stuff in both directions. Zombies are making a little bit of a comeback. Are there, like, games coming as well or there's games there's movies uh there's a bunch of board games there's uh there's a there's a lot of stuff coming they're gonna do there's a, actually gonna be a marvel zombies board game <laughs> marvel zombies board game it's based on an existing game but it's getting a marvel zombies theme and i was like cool that that that, that that's definitely new the only time that i've seen a zombie game that's been tempting to me on the xbox has been the plants versus zombies games but yeah. it's not it's not the mobile one though it looks like it's a first person shooter yep there, there is a first person shooter one that is it, it it's very it's very pay to win oh okay never mind i'm glad that i haven't bothered to, to check it out then yeah it, it's full of like card packs and things and it tries to encourage you to spend money on it because oh, okay. it's a budget game it's like a 30 dollar game and it's by EA and EA is constantly trying to get people to spend money on stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I can, I get that feeling. Okay. I, that's too bad. I like, I, I've been looking for new stuff and I've, I've downloaded and installed a new one. It's not zombie based, but it is kind of like post-apocalyptic. It's called the gunk. I think is that the name of it. It was recommended by Ryan, your co-host on, on Zamp. Hey, hey I, this is not a game I am familiar with, so it's news to me. I'm going to just look up the title of this real quick just to make sure that I have it right. It is, yep, The Gunk, the G-U-N-K. Uh, and it just, it looks like you're just, uh, it's an action adventure video game. You know, you're going to, you've got like a big like robot arm that you've got connected to things. And I, I, I think Gunk is some sort of like environment pollutant that you have to control and destroy and redistribute and use through, you know, your adventures to your advantage and probably to enemies disadvantage but it just looks really fun it, it's got one of those cartoony type vibes so like I, you don't have to worry about it being super realistic but i just yeah it's i don't know if there's zombies in it but it has that kind of look that yeah it, it, it definitely might, does it, i'm looking at images right now it definitely looks like like that style of game yeah anyway so that that's been on my my hit list but i can't say that i've I mean, ever since the Walking Dead, early Walking Dead TV show, I've not really gotten into more zombie movies or zombie TV shows. Like, I, I, I mean, I, and I'm not poo pooing the f- people that like them, but do you ever find that there's just like an oversaturation? Like, do you think that the world is ever going to move out of the the zombie phase? Um, I don't know if they're ever going to move out of the zombie phase. I think it's a genre that's going to be here to stay. Uh, I just it 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 wanes and it it has peaks and waves of good content. Right. So you'll get good content for two or three years, and then we get garbage because all of a sudden they realize it's selling, and so everybody tries to make one, and most of them are garbage. And then it 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 uh, it it, it comes in waves. Like I said, it, it, uh, there's a lot of garbage out there, a lot of garbage, and we've had to watch a lot of it for Zamp. <laughs> yeah, I have one bookmarked on Netflix and I have had since I think it came out on Netflix. I mean, not it's been out for a while, but it, it was put on the Netflix catalog around Halloween this year, which you recommended, which was The Dead Don't Die with uh, Bill Murray and, um, oh gosh, um, Adam Driver. Yeah. 
it's worth watching for Bill Murray and Adam Driver. The movie itself, it's good. It's not great. Yeah, well, that's it, and that's what I would be, watch. It'll be it, those guys. Yeah. It, it, it will be it will be that will be entertaining for you as them. But don't expect the plot to make any sense. Oh, I wouldn't. No, I would not go in expecting uh, a lot of sense. Uh, 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 like it makes it starts making reference to to. I won't spoil it. It starts making self-referential jokes, and you're like, "Wait, what am I watching?" <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, but I, I mean, I like those some of those kind of films. Like a lot of the stuff that Bill Murray is in. Like, um, was he in the Grand Budapest Hotel? No, that was no, no, he wasn't in that one. But it's the same director. Yes, he I was. Think. He was in Grand Budapest Hotel, yeah. but he was a bit part. Right, but like those kind of those kind of films, I do find funny. Like those yeah. kind of self-referential, or th they understand what they are. They're they're not trying to live outside of yeah. some specific uh, box. The one I'm looking forward to, there's two that I'm looking forward to watching. Hopefully this year, uh, one came, uh, I think both came out last year, but they were limited release. Uh, there's a new Resident Evil movie, and that's coming to streaming, like in the next month or two, I believe. And the other one is uh um uh uh Bruce Campbell is another zombie movie that was done for the holidays that's coming out called Black Friday and it's about a a, a zombie outbreak uh during Black Friday at Thanksgiving uh, like after Thanksgiving here in America and like they're trying to close the store but the everybody that comes through the store is getting turned into a zombie and it's like it, it looks like it it could be at least entertaining the thing that I find um, overwhelming, not overwhelming, the thing where I roll my eyes is like when I see like a zombie game, you know, like a Left 4 Dead or a, a Back for Blood or like, like I just, I yep. always find that kind of stuff. It just feels like they all look the same from the outside. And I wouldn't, I mean, I would, I mean, thankfully I have uh, two resources in you and Ryan that I can say like, is this worth downloading? Is this worth playing? Whereas like with um, Back for Blood, you mentioned like, it's not, it's not the, the best single player ex experience. So it's awful single player. Um, Even it's multiplayer. It, they're, they're revamping that game like on a weekly basis. Yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah. Uh, it, it sold really well. It just doesn't have a huge player base. Well, and that's the thing where like, when if I come across a game like that, that's seeing a lot of hype or news or mentions in my circles and I check it out and it's like, it just looks like every other zombie game I've ever played. So I always have to turn to somebody else that like knows what they're talking about. Like, well, is this worth it? Like, do I really want to try playing this? And I just, I ultimately it boils down to time, but um, yep. yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I just, I've, I've not been bitten by that bug. And so I'm so unfamiliar with that, that genre. Although uh, on the holiday round table, James mentioned doom. And it's not a zombie game, but it has that kind of vibe with like, yeah, kind of it has a very much that kind of zombies vibe. and blood and guts and all that kind of stuff. And that is now that's available on Xbox Game Pass as well. Um, my first person shooter time is taken up by Halo Infinite right now. And even then, I'm not playing that very much. Um, but uh, getting into um, Doom would be fun because that's like it's not zombies, but it's the that's that the level of that genre that I would probably appreciate. Also, I mean, it's definitely faster paced than Halo Two. Yes, and and Doom was um like one of my first next to Wolfenstein. It would have been like one of my first first person shooters ever yep. as a teenager, like back in the day. So it's got a little bit of you know familiarity and and nostalgia and stuff attached to it. I know it's not the same now, but um because it look it looks wildly different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah looks very very different um but i'm just thinking like you know maybe on the xbox with the 4k tv and now the new govi lights that i've been using stuff like that um it i think that'd be kind of fun we have an email this week from dan about tuscan raiders hi joel and lou i have just listened to episode 428 and heard you talking about the tuscan raiders which brought an interesting real life parallel to my mind according to dan carlin's celtic holocaust episode from his hardcore history series the Celts could have been, maybe not been a tribe or nation in the usual sense, but more of a movement, like being a punk. In case you're not familiar with ancient European history, the Celts are rather unknown tribes uh, that were everywhere around Europe during the heights of the Roman Empire and afterwards, but details about them are lost in history. Also, please bear in mind that Dan Carlin is not a historian and mentions that often enough himself, so take statements with a grain of salt. He mentions that on the podcast as well. Great show. Please keep on delivering. Cheers, Dan. And we'll have a link to uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. I believe it's episode 60 
uh, the Celtic Holocaust. Uh, the link goes to YouTube, but I'm sure you can find the podcast just about anywhere. Um, I'm not familiar with um, the series having listened firsthand, but I, I've heard of the Hardcore History um, podcast. Um, it's the kind of thing that I probably should listen to. It's worth a listen. Yeah, this is the kind of information that I find really interesting. So for people that might not have heard last episode, Stephen and I were talking about how the way that the Tuscan Raiders are wrapped up conceals most things, including even gender. Uh, we picked up that the, the, the Tuscan Raider that's training Boba Fett in the last episode, um, episode two, uh, is, a, is a woman played by a woman, but we didn't dig into it too much for spoilers. Like we didn't want to, if it was somebody important in Star Wars, we didn't want to reveal that too soon. Um, yeah. but uh, you also can't tell age outside of stature. Like unless they're a really little yep. kid, once they're like full grown, like 18 or plus, you have no idea how old these people are. Uh, and, yeah, and, you you, have, and you don't know what they look like underneath. They could be human for all you know. And, or they could be a bunch of different aliens altogether. And what ties them yep. together is being Tuscan Raiders in that culture, not the fact that they're of the same planet, same area, whatever. Uh, yep. I mean, it's possible and it's more likely that they're the same kind of race or species underneath, but it's not important to the story. And I, we both th thought that was very interesting. So this idea of Celts perhaps not being all the same um, race or creed or whatever you want to, you know, however you want to break it down, but instead being a movement, almost like a political movement um, or, or, or what, ha what not happening in the time of the, the Roman empire, I thought was re really, really interesting. And it got me thinking about the fact that I don't spend as much time watching educational television like documentaries as I used to. And I think it boils down to how they tell the stories. It's, it's like the documentary makers want or feel the need to try and up the ante to increase the visual stimulation of the viewer and they end up either rushing it or not having the budget because when i was younger and watching these kinds of things i used to watch tv like this all the time and it was very often like you'd have let's say let's talk about dinosaurs for example you'll have a couple of paleontologists being interviewed so they'll flip back and forth between b-roll of like actually sitting down and talking to those people who are knowledgeable and passionate about what they're talking about there might be some slides and some artwork or or some bones or uh scenes from a museum where they've they've uncovered some some skeletons as they're talking about this particular dinosaur and giving you the details of how they think it might have lived fast forward to now and you're barely going to get even a sit down interview with one of the paleontologists. It's going to be someone, probably a well-known Hollywood actor, reading a script over a CG animated kind of like reenactment of what they think that these dinosaurs were like. And I find that it's true of stuff about Roman history as well. I thought I might have found a new Roman TV show like set like a, time, a period piece set in the Roman Empire and press play on Netflix only to find out that it's a documentary, but it's all these, it's, it's got all these like actors in it. I say actors lightly because it's really basically oh. like walking set pieces and it, it's, so it's filmed like a TV show, but the whole time there's someone doing voiceovers talking about like, well, this is where the Romans would use their special shields to do this and this kind of technique. And it always just feels so I don't know. It feels like the presentation you'd get from like a, a vi an educational video in your high school where you're just kind of like rolling your eyes. The presentation is so dated and bad. And yep. I've checked out of these documentaries, despite the fact that they they're probably providing interesting information, but it's just, it's the presentation that gets campy for me. And I check out. My, my, my problem with most documentaries is uh, they either go overboard and you get Tiger King <laughs> where you're like where you go oh my god why am i watching this this is awful i'm turning the, turning this off yep. or they go the they, they're trying to they're trying to sell you on something they're not just telling you historical fact they're trying to sell you on something there was a there was a i love video game documentaries like learning the history behind something that's video game related because that's just kind of my thing and Netflix has put out a couple of them and they did one a while back and it was only like six episodes. And I think they announced they weren't going to do anymore because it didn't get well received. And I totally get why it wasn't well received. They, instead of just telling the story about the video game and how it got made and talking about whatever, they kept making it about political issues that were things that I was like, 
but this isn't telling me about the history of the game. You've just spent 25 minutes talking about something that nobody cares about. Like, I, like it's not, you're not changing the history of the game. You're trying to make it about how politically uh, this is not, this is different. From na- it, this game would be easy, easy, made easier now than it was in the 80s. I get that. But that, we don't need to talk about that. Tell me the history of the game. I don't care about the difference in uh, in politics from 20 years ago. Unless you're going to talk about them trying to ban video games, then this doesn't need to be in the conversation. Tell me the history of who these people are that made the game and why it's an important piece of history. And they didn't do that. And I was like, well, I'm not going to watch documentaries on Netflix much anymore. Yeah. I've I've had a hit or miss. Uh, I don't remember whether... The Power of Grayskull was produced by Netflix. I think it was just distributed by Netflix because it was a Canadian team that made it. Um, yep. But that was uh, episode 285 of the Citadel Cafe uh, back in 2018. And that's one of the examples of a really good documentary that I thought was was excellent and worth checking out um, versus something like The Toys That Made Us, which do the other thing that drives me nuts in documentaries currently, which is like they up the drama, like they edit it like a reality TV show. Yep. where they're they're cutting people off in their interviews they're taking things out of context and they're trying to manufacture some sort of story or drama despite the fact that like the making of these toys were probably just kind of business as usual <laughs> like it really was not this dramatic <laughs> you know? yep the, the the films that made us does the same thing but i yeah. feel like it's a different team because the films that made us do kind of a better job of it oh do they that's good because yeah. i i've seen those scroll by on netflix and i've been tempted to throw them on sometime i don't like every episode but the episodes that are based on movies i enjoy i usually know most of the history behind the movie already and it's pretty interesting they look like the kind of thing i might be able to put on while i do dishes you know yep that's exactly what they're good for. Yeah, so that that's good to know because I, I'm often struggling. Or like even with I'm just I'm eating a meal. I've been running into this thing where like there's a lot of really cool stuff that came out over the holidays, and I've kind of gone through it, and now I'm like, like oh crap, I've I'm I'm sitting down to eat in like ten minutes, and I have no idea what to throw on the TV, and people are just like Joel, you shouldn't watch TV and eat. I just I live alone, <laughs> so and yep. my my dining room table is behind my couch and it faces the television. So having something on the screen is usually the way I roll. Plus, it helps me catch up on stuff for podcasts. But um, I've just been indecisive slash finding things that just are missing the mark. Uh, or I've noticed a lot of stuff lately has had really poor sound mixes, where like it's hard to hear even at high volumes what people are saying because of the way that they've mixed the sound. And I just I find that really frustrating. Um, another documentary that I was looking up frantically while we were talking is uh, the Lego Brickumentary, uh, which um, it's the one that uh, Jason Bateman did the narration for. That's a good yep. one. I, I quite enjoyed that. That was a really fun and interesting look into the history of the company and, and how it's going and all that kind of stuff. So there are good ones out there. Um, I would stay away from the toys that made us on uh, Netflix. Um, we've talked about it here on the show where we got excited about it, but then realized that it was kind of a dumpster fire. I believe the same team that did that is the same team that did the video game documentary I didn't like. Um, they, 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 they were supposed to be an episode. I'm not a football game guy, but they did an entire episode that was, was on sports games. And they were talking about the late John Madden and how they got EA got Madden to actually sign off on making a game and this, that, and the other thing. And then in the middle of the episode, they go off on a tangent for some guy I didn't know who he was. He wasn't like a huge name in video game design, but he was like one of the first openly gay programmers to work on a sports game. And they sp- it's only like a 30 minute episode and they spend like 15 minutes with this guy and he talks about what it's like to be gay. And I'm like, that's not what the sports episode for video games is supposed to be about. I'm I, I tell set aside an episode for him. And talk about what it was what it was like to be openly gay in the video game industry in the '90s. That's fine, but don't make the sports episode about him. That's not about sports. Yeah, yeah, they seem to be a little bit like misleading with their presentation, but then also just like off point. Like they just they yeah. tend to meander in ways that you... it it feels like they didn't know what they were getting themselves into, and then the creator gets sidetracked by something they find interesting that mm. the audience probably doesn't. Right. We would never do that on a podcast. I don't know what you're talking about, Lou. Moving yeah, I on. know, I know. 
Uh, thanks again for the email, Dan. Uh, we'll have a link to uh, to the the Dan Carlin uh, episode on YouTube as well uh, in the show notes. Uh, this week, I've actually spent uh, about an even amount of time between watching stuff and uh, and playing stuff. And I will note that yes, I know that the third episode of of the Book of Boba Fett is on Disney Plus. No, I have not watched it yet, so we're not going to talk about that. We're going to maybe catch up with that next week. Um, and, uh, the rest of my time I have been splitting between, uh, things like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Forza Horizon 5, and I did watch Raya and the Last Dragon on Disney Plus. Finally, I've been waiting for an opportunity to sit down and catch up on some of my feature animated films. Um, I'll start with Assassin's Creed because I don't have a lot to say about it. Uh, I did get into a rant last week about the HDR issues and the graphic quality of that game. Uh, I have not really spent a lot more time in it because of that and i know that i probably need to play a little bit more uh i feel like i've spent a lot of time in the game but really most of the time i've been spending is troubleshooting and so i've only just unlocked like the stealthy wrist blades that you get in assassin's creed yep. and so i haven't done many of the missions beyond that so i haven't done anything stealthy i'm basically just like brute forcing my way um through these battles and i find the combat pretty clunky uh, I did a little bit of Reddit research and found that a lot of people felt the same, uh, especially people that hadn't played an Assassin's Creed game in a little while. They're like, so were the last ones this clunky? Because I don't remember these games being that clunky. And yeah. I think it comes down to it's a Viking story. So right up, the combat is just different. You're not like the last time I played an Assassin's Creed game was Black Flag, which has like sabers and parrying and like all this kind of fancy sword and dagger work. Whereas this game, it's like axe, a blunt object, and you're just kind of like, it's not fast. And right. one, one tip that I picked up, which didn't make the combat feel any better, but I certainly died a lot less, was to slow down, like immensely. And block with your shield when you get one, and then wait to counter, and just watch yeah. for the animations, and just really, really slow things down. Which to me is fine, but it's not quite as exciting as they it, as they portray yeah. it to be, right? And so I have not been enjoying that too much. Now, right away, the other things that they nailed that I thought were cool was like I got to get in my long boat with my my crew, and the moment that you get on a boat and you climb up on the back of it and you start giving orders and you can sail across the the channel and the fjord to your hometown, like that was cool and it looked great. Um, so there are moments in the game where the HDR either does work or I have the settings right. Uh, and it, it looks very, very cool. Um, and, and I'm satisfied and it feels like Assassin's Creed. Like it feels, okay, so, you know, it feels right. familiar. Right. Um, but then there's other time in the fighting. I'm just kind of like, I'm trying to figure out like why I can't block. And then you realize, Oh, that's a red attack. I can't block a red attack. I have to wait for the big yellow attack. And the thing is like, they put these giant glowing markers on these attacks. It's like, this doesn't feel like Assassin's Creed at all. This feels like World of Warcraft, right? Like it feels like a giant telegraph, but the game doesn't give you any other information other than like, this is how you block. It's like, well, don't tell me I can block. And then later on say, oh, but not that. <laughs> but what do you mean? Not that Like, I just died right. because you told me how to block. I blocked and it didn't work. <laughs> My biggest gripe is I played the first three Assassin's Creed games or five because mm -hmm. two had three two had three sequels or two sequels and I love them. But then when they after Black Flag, which added ship stuff, it felt like they all just it became it's the same thing every time. And then I would go and play some other Ubisoft game and it felt like Assassin's Creed with a new skin. And I was like, OK, so that's just what Ubisoft does. They make the same games. And then just theme them. Okay, I'm moving on to other things because this is getting boring. And it and, and every time someone tells me about an Assassin's Creed game, I'm like, okay, so it's the same thing as what I was playing a decade ago. They haven't changed anything. Cool. All right. I haven't missed anything. Well, and this the thing is like I heard so many good things. Like so much of the the gaming circles that I follow were raving about Valhalla last Christmas when it came out. Like I'm glad I only yeah. paid thirty dollars for it. I mean, I'm and I yeah. will put some time into it. I'm sure when I'm in the right mood, it will be fine. Yeah. The problem that I have, of course, is that it just to get it to look right out of the box is is rough. And the fact that it's a story based game, and when you go to these cutscenes, they're obviously automated by algorithms because the lip syncs and the movements are terrible. 
Like it's 2022 now. Uh, there is no excuse for a character to be continuing to move like they're talking after the audio is stopped. Yep. It like it just even if you're using an algorithm, you should at least be able to like stop the character from moving, stop their mouth from moving, and stop their head from bobbing when the audio's done. And yep. It's like the people that make the games don't ever watch the cutscenes. Because if I was working in any level of quality assurance or just like putting my name on something as an animator or someone that was in charge of a scene, I would be embarrassed to push that forward and say like, yeah, that's done. And I, I get that crunch is a thing. And I know that there's a lot of situations in the gaming industry where people are overworked and underpaid and all that kind of stuff. And maybe they don't give a shit. And that's fine. But I mean, I, I wish there was a way to see this kind of stuff and I, I could have done more research, but I also didn't want to spoil the story for myself either, right? Um, right. But like, I wish I could look ahead, look at some cutscenes from Valhalla and be just like, wow, that looks like garbage. I'm not going to buy that. But, you know, instead I just, it was on Amazon on 30 bucks on Black Friday. I was buying a bunch of stuff anyway. I thought, you know, Merry Christmas to me. Under 30 bucks is, is pretty good um, for a game that's only a year old and, and a AAA title that probably would have cost nearly $100 had I bought it outright. Um so yeah, I'm going to give it more time uh, when I'm in the mood for it. But what is working just out of the box looks flipping amazing, is easy to pick up and put down and go 400 kilometers an hour is Forza Horizon 5. Uh, have you played any of the Forza games? I've played some of the early ones. Remind me, is Horizons the one that's more, it's less realistic and more arcadey? Definitely more arcadey. Yeah, okay. definitely more. You right. can, you can turn I've... on, you can turn on a realistic or simulation and that like, if you run over a lamppost and you damage your car, you got to pay to fix it. Right. Yeah. Um, or, and things like, you know, there's wear and tear mm -hmm. on tires and drive shafts and all that kind of stuff. But no, you can, if you're just playing like standard or, or normal, whatever that mode is called on the game, then your car takes damage. Like if you get into a car crash and roll the car and like your, your Lamborghini is scratched to hell and all you have to do is switch cars and then switch back and it comes back brands make a new. Um, and to me, that's just enough incentive to like not drive around crashing into everything. Cause you right. just, it's not, it takes like 10, 15 seconds to switch cars, but like, you're still like, I just, I don't want to go through the bother of it. It takes you out of the game a little bit. Um, yep. and it's, so it's, adds just a little bit of a fun challenge, like to not drive through all kinds of crap constantly. And that's just when you're driving around the world. Right. So the, w the way that it's set up is that it's, um, it's an exhibition showcase. So like you're a superstar driver or so they refer to you as a superstar driver and you are at horizon mexico and so the whole thing yeah. is set in mexico it's one of the it's the largest horizon map that they've ever put out and um and it goes from like you know the jungle to the beaches there's like this cool bridge and tunnels and stuff and there's a active volcano that you can drive by and um there's different race modes so like as you travel around there's like road racing which is like kind of like street racing there's yep. off-road which is you know rally car you know you're going around in a couple of loops with a you know dirt track and like a one of those really tricked out rally cars that like you know sounds like a a bumblebee on speed going around corners and stuff and and then there's um normal racing which is like you know your typical tracks where you'll have like ferraris and things like that and then cross country and cross country tend to not be loops they tend to just be like straight well not straight but like one single length or, or, or track that goes from point A to point B and you have one go and you see where you place, but you're like, you're jumping over cliffs and you're doing like flips over sand dunes. And like, it's, it's fun. Like there's a lot of really cool stuff that's happening in the game. But what gets me about it, um, is, you know, as much complaining as I did last week about the HDR implementation in Valhalla, granted, Forza Horizon 5 is cars and there's, you know, the people don't look the best in the game because that's not the focus. Yeah. But dude, I'm playing on an Xbox Series X. I've got the quality turned on. So it's, it's, it's favoring quality graphics over FPS, which is fine. I'm still getting between 30 and 60 FPS. Um, and for a driving game, I argue, you can't really see the stuff on the side of the road when you're doing 200 kilometers an hour. And it looks phenomenal. Like, you can see the reflections of the clouds in the rear window mm -hmm. of your car as you're driving along. 
driving games have come a long way from the oh. PlayStation One games. I remember driving and thinking, "Oh, this looks so realistic." And it, you look at it now and you go, "Yeah, it's a square box that they call the car." And the, yeah. this is looks, yeah. I mean, everything is just so pretty, and I I really like for Forza Horizon Four as well. I mean, it was set in England and Scotland, and it was still colorful in spots. But we're talking Mexico, like the 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 center where you're doing your big um presentations and stuff is is all pink you know uh the the city that you drive through has got colors uh on the houses that are just like rainbow like you think any kind of you know mexican film or media that you've seen in the last little while especially anything around a holiday it's just so bright and vibrant and colorful i've also driven through a desert in south utah yeah and granted this is different that like the the vegetation and stuff is different the fact that I'm no longer driving through rolling hills in Europe where you can only see about, you know, 100 to 300 meters in front of you. I'm driving across deserts in Mexico where like I can see where I'm wow. going like yeah. as I'm driving to it. Uh and and some of the highways are nearly straight lines. Like I they give you like little accolades for like doing certain personal bests. I think it was a Porsche Spider and I don't remember whether I won the car or bought the car. I think I won the car. And I was like, oh, cool. That or they give it to you, which I thought was really cool. Um, either way, I had the car doing 396 kilometers an hour on this highway. Like, I felt uncomfortable in the video game <laughs> going that fast. <laughs> like, it was it was just stupid. Like, it was, yeah. but but so satisfying to pass cars on your, like, that are on your right as if they're going by like oncoming traffic. That's how fast they go by. And they're traveling with you, <laughs> not towards you. Yeah. Um, like it's just, it's just ridiculous. And like little touches, like you can remove the roofs of some cars if they're convertibles. Um, yeah, I don't switch views that much. Like I like to either be down where you can see the hood of the car or up behind the vehicle. I tend to find yeah. it easier to drive because I'm not the best at the game. I find it easier to drive right. up behind the vehicle, but the things, the modes that I'm enjoying the most so far, and it might just because it's one of the first things I did. I unlocked a couple of points with this car. I can't remember the name of the car that I'm driving. It's a brand that I didn't recognize, but uh, I'm doing like the rally car races. So I'm basically traveling around the map. And anytime there's a little green cactus on the mini map that says, you know, there's a rally car race here. I try to do that and I'll play that until I place first or at the very least I rank ahead of Ryan. Because Ryan shows up on the on the Ryan shows up on the roster as as my as a friend that plays online, and if he's finished like second and I'm fourth, I'm just like, nope, I'm redoing that. <laughs> so yep, no, okay. I, I I I I have been down that road many many times. Yeah, and I've I I didn't I meant to take a screenshot uh, or at least take a snap with my camera uh, and send it to him because there was one where like I basically beat him by like I came first, he came second, and it was like two tenths of a second. Like I mean I. <laughs> squeezed by i'm just like ha got it um and then the game says you're winning pretty regularly would you like to up the difficulty level i'm just like yeah sure no. that sounds fair yeah then i get smoked like i finished 10th the next race i'm just like all right how many times i'm gonna beat my head against this but i i do find that the game is pretty balanced in that way like they if you lose three times in a row they'll also say look you're getting you're not really having a good time would you like us to lower the difficulty level and i thought that's really cool like i, I like the fact that it kind of says like you're probably not having fun right now <laughs> so you might a want to change a lot this of around. games are doing stuff like that now i forget what it was i was playing an action game recently like like something i picked up over the holidays and i was doing okay but i died like two times in a row just cuz i couldn't get a jump like it wasn't like i was doing bad I was doing fine, but like I died twice and the game was like, we're going to pause here now. Are you sure you don't want to lower the difficulty setting? And I was like, the jumping has nothing to do with the difficulty setting. So I'm going to say no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, the difficulty here controls, I think it might give you a little bit more steering control. Like I think it might, you might drift less easily and, and you might have more um, like acceleration off the mark, like that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. but it also reduces the AI of the drive avatars is what they call the other drivers. Yeah. Um, yeah. because I'm not racing against necessarily Ryan, but it's more like it takes like an amalgamation of like the, his best three laps on that particular track. 
and then yep. just kind of puts him in the game. I think his final time is still correct, but like as far as like where he is on the track and stuff like that, because there's other there's 12 other or 10, 11 other cars in most cases. Um, but I've really, like I said, I've really been enjoying the dirt tracks. Like they, for whatever reason, they just, they really nail that feeling of breaking just before a corner, hitting the turn and then accelerating through it as like, you kind of drift around the corner. And I mean, most racing games do it, but this, once you figure it out in Forza, which I did in Forza four. So doing the off-road stuff in Forza five, it's a little trickier. I find I fishtail more. Um, but yeah. that, that could be down to like, I'm into summer now because the game goes through seasons. And by the way, the light in this game is phenomenal and it's changing constantly. So if it's not, you know, seasons like summer, winter, spring, fall, it's like the sun just went behind a cloud. Yeah. You know, it's not like it's raining that much because it's Mexico, unless it's the wet season. And unless you're in a specific race where like, it's meant to be a, me a wet, muddy race in the jungle. And you're so they certainly not going to get snow. No, exactly. Well, yeah, you can't, you, but if you go up into the mountains, you can, right? So there's the volcano. Right. And if you go up high enough in the game, they'll give you like some snowy trails, which I thought was cool as well. Um, the sound that your car makes when it goes over the snow is pretty fun. Um, but yeah, like the stuff like that, uh, I find really, really, uh, just jaw droppingly beautiful. Like there are times when I log in where I'm just kind of like, half the time I'm looking for my next race. And the other time I'm thinking like, what is the farthest race from where I am right now? So I can spend the next five minutes driving across the map and just enjoying it. It yeah. it's, oh, it's really, really cool. And the last positive point that I've got, and really don't have much negative to say about it is, is that they really get you off to the races, pardon the pun super quickly. So because Forza came out in like October uh, and I haven't had time to jump into it, I had like six to eight messages in my like Forza social section and they're all from the Forza team. Half of them have got money in them, like um, credits in the game. And I'm talking like 100,000, 300,000 credits. And some of them have free cars. I think yep. that might've been where I got the, the Porsche Spider. Um, I got like a Ford Focus and like some other stuff too. And there's like a happy new year, have a car. And it's just, it's something fun, like a four wheeler or like a buggy or a dune buggy or something. But it means that you just, you, when you go into these races now on the map, you basically have one of everything. It might not be the best car, but like, I've got a classic muscle car from the seventies, which I never want to gone out and purchase, but like, it's fun to tear around the map on this thing. You do drag strip yep. racing with it. Like the fact that they just say. Yes, you're going to have to play to unlock money in this game, but there's so many bonuses. And if you know what you're doing with the bonus system, which is like, you know, you get money, you get bonus points for sliding or passing or passing somebody in the air. <laughs> I didn't even realize that was yeah. a thing. I, I did. I went over a jump. And as I went over the jump, I realized that I passed over top of a car that was previously like in front of me. And I got like some sort of bonus for like air pass. I'm just like, I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, but they allow you to very quickly get to like a million credits and they give you like six cars right away, which means that no matter what you want to do, you have something you've got a you convertible have some kind of, a, you have some kind of variety. Yeah. That's the best. I, I, I forget what game it was. I'm not much of a driving game guy, but there was a game I got in a bundle a couple of years, maybe a couple, year or two ago. And I played it and it made me start with this like super generic, super balanced car, but it wasn't fast and it didn't handle well either. And it was like, yeah, you've got to drive this for the next 25 races till you can unlock the next one and earn enough money. And I was like, nope, yeah. I don't like driving this thing. Give me something else to drive. And then finally I unlocked something and it was like, yeah, this is one that handles better, but it drives slower. And I'm like, so when do I get the fast car that handles well? And it was like, oh, you've got to play a hundred hours. I was like, nope, oh, I'm done. Yeah. I think the first time that I unlocked a car, I think I won like a Lamborghini hurricane. And I was like, I don't even know what this is. Like I had to look it up on the internet. And, mm -hmm. and I was driving around in Forza four and I realized like, cause the way that the game works and I've talked about this on the show before, where you can change the way that that gives you your drive line. It'll be constantly there blue. Most of the time, yellow on corners where you need to slow down and red where you need to break really quickly. Cause it's going to be a hard corner and you can remove the blue line and say, only give me the drive line on corners, which is great. Cause it, it, it's more of a simulation that you feel like you're driving, but every once in a while they'll tell you, okay, this corner where you're going 200 clicks, like you're going to have to slow down to take this U-turn. Right. 
And it's great because I, I don't like the feeling of sliding off the road. Um, and every single car is different. So like if you're driving a Lamborghini versus driving a Ford Focus, like they're going to break at different times. The handling is different. Like it's, it's confusing. So having the game tell you, you need to slow down sooner with one car versus the other is, is great. But something I've picked up on is that different cars need to break at different hues of that yellow, right? Lamborghini, you can floor it and the turn can be yellow and you can be fine. You don't even have to break yep. because the handling and everything on the car is so good. Whereas other cars that might be faster or more muscly, but also the handling is not great, that great. So you really have to slow down. And then there's other cars still that can rip around a corner when the thing is almost red, where normally you'd be off the side of the road. And yep. one of these like high performance sports cars, just, just like it takes the corner like nothing. And so yep. getting to know that has been really satisfying. But the thing that I like about it is that you, you, with Forza, they really give you a taste of everything right away. And I've learned to just be like, I got a new car. The first thing I should do is get into this new car and just drive across the map to some other race. It didn't look like much. It was a BMW. It's pretty standard looking. I, it didn't strike me as anything that famous that I might've known. And I drove it across the map. I was like, this car is really fun. It has just enough slide to it when you go around the corners that it squeals. And yeah. Uh, but not so much that you're like spinning out sideways and ending up knocking over cactuses and causing a mess. And I've, I've just been having a lot of fun with, you know, exploring that kind of new stuff. And within, I'll say I've probably spent about 10 to 15 hours playing the game. I have more cars than I've been able to drive. Like I've, I've got 12 or 16 in my garage. I think I've only driven like six in terms of like seriously getting to know the car. So, um, even if you're not a, like a driving person, I, I know I've said this on the podcast before, but I really encourage people to check out Forza Horizon 5, especially if you're a, a Game Pass person because it's $16.99 Canadian a month, uh, comes out to be about 20 bucks with taxes here in my region. And yep. I'm playing that plus Halo plus uh, the gunk that I mentioned at the top of the show. I'm going to be playing that hopefully this weekend. Like th all of that for like 20 bucks uh, uh, a month, which is for me, Forza is worth it alone. And, and I yep. think that, um, that people would really, really enjoy it. So, uh, check it out, especially, um, I've seen other footage as well. It looks really good on the S and it looks really good on the Xbox one as well. So it's yep. not like it's a garbage game, uh, on lower consoles. Like it, it looks fantastic the whole way around. Hard to make a bad looking game nowadays. So what have you been up to this week, man? I've been playing, I picked up something, uh, on sale over, over the holiday season that, uh, I've been hiding for a while. I had heard good things. An indie game called Forgotten City. And it's basically, it started out its production as a Skyrim mod. It was going to originally be like somebody making mod content for Skyrim. And they got into making it and they decided to go in a different direction. And so it's sort of like a history, a, a historical thing. And it's not real. It's not real. But the idea is, is you're the, you wake up on a, uh, you wake up, uh, on the shore of the Tib uh, the Tiber River in Rome, and there's this woman in a hooded cloak, and she's like, "Oh, I'm so glad I rescued you. What were you doing in the river? And you don't remember who you are, or you don't remember most of what why you're there or how you got there. And you're like, "Oh yeah." Uh, and then it gives you a choice, and based on your choice, changes your ability in the game. Like there's one that gives you more uh, the ability to run faster, one that gives you the ability to do. I picked. The historian that I'm a historian and I fell in the river and so I get more historical history when I play the game and the idea is she goes oh uh I rescued another guy and he ran into that building over there and it's a he said that it's some kind of historic thing uh but he hasn't come out in a while do you want to go take a look for me uh and you and you either say yes or or no the the default answer is you have to go into the building. And when you go into the building, you find this old ancient Roman building. And there's this plaque on the door that says, like, like all who live here must live under the, uh, the like, like the punishment of the one is the punishment for all or something like that. And you're like, what? And then the floor gives out and you wake up in uh, like a pool and you're in an underground city an underground roman city that's all dark and everybody has been turned to gold like the whole city is just people made of gold and you find out that the guy you're following 
he, like you, was another historian, found this place, and he warns you, don't step into the portal. And you're like, what portal? What are you talking about? And you step through the portal, and you find out you're now in the city, but it's 2,000 years in the past, in the middle of ancient Rome. And you're greeted by a guy. He's a farmer. And he says, oh, you're new here. I have to take you to the magistrate. And you go to the magistrate, and the guy goes, if you're here, then I have failed. And you're like, what? He's like, from where in time are you from? And you're like, 2,000 years in the future? And he's like, oh, so the spell worked. And you're like, what? And he's like, uh, we've all ended up in this city and we can't leave. And we all live under what we've called the golden rule. If any of us commit a sin, we're all turned to gold and we all die. And I'm going to cast a spell if anything goes wrong that will that the goddess whatever will help us, but it's going to pull somebody through time. So if you're here, then that means I've failed somewhere and somebody in this city is going to break the golden rule today. And you're like, okay. And so you wander around the city meeting people and greeting them. And then at some point, somebody breaks the golden rule. Either they murder somebody, they steal something, or the golden rule is real vague. People don't know what constitutes breaking the golden rule and at that point it becomes a race to get back to the portal where you came from and you start the whole day over again it's like groundhog day the game huh. in ancient rome and every time you cycle the day they do a, the writing is really good because as soon as you get down to the bottom of the steps the farmer guy greets you again and you're like yeah yeah shut up <laughs> and, and literally you can be like nope nope do this and then there's another cycle where you've learned that somebody's in danger and they're going to die. And you literally walk up to him and you go, no, don't talk to me. Go over here and take this thing that I've got here and go give it to that person. And they're like, wait, what? And he's like, you're like, no, shut up. Take the thing. Go give it to the person. I'll talk to you later. And, you're, and the guy's like, but who are you? Shut up. Just go. And like, and like the cycle goes again. And then somewhere along the way, something else fails. And at every turn, it's like you learn a little bit more about what's going on. You learn a little bit more about what's going on. And the idea is you're supposed to break the cycle. And the the first thing you ask the guy that brought you there, the magistrate, is, so how do I get home? And he goes, if I understand the way the spell works, is at some point when you fix our problem, you're going to cause a paradox. And the paradox means you go home. And you're like, okay. And so every day. It's like you figure out a little bit more of the puzzle. You fight, figure out a little more of the puzzle. And you you get objects that kind of make the game do different things. Uh, like at one point, uh, I've got a... You technically have a weapon, but if you kill anybody, it start, everybody starts turning to gold. And the way it happens is, is there's all these golden statues everywhere. Because this has apparently happened a bunch of times. And there's only like 20 or 30 people living in this city. So it's not a big city. And whenever somebody breaks the golden rule, the statues come to life with bow and arrows and they start shooting the other people and turning them into gold. And so when the the event happens, you have to run past the statues as fast as you can. And at some point, I got my own golden bow. And so you use the bow instead of killing stuff, you use it to turn things to gold so that you could climb them or a jump on them because they would be solid. So you shoot them with gold and they become gold and you could now stand on that platform kind of thing. Oh, and neat. so there's a puzzle. So there's like a puzzle aspect to it. And you and, and every time you meet somebody, you have to go back and talk to them a second time because you learn something else the next cycle. So then you go back to the guy and you're like, yeah, don't don't like don't try and sell me that piece of crap. I'm not buying it. Or at one point you need money to buy something. So you go into this guy's shop and you rob him and you steal all his money. and then. It says somebody has committed a sin. The golden rule has been broken. And so you run back, you start the cycle over again, and then you show up to that guy and he's trying to gouge you for buying something that you need to save somebody's life. And you hand him the money and you go, here you go. And it's because you stole it from him the last cycle. Oh, so you have the stuff from the, like the cycle doesn't yeah, reset. The, the, the cycle resets time, but anything you have in your inventory is yours still. And so you go through the cycle, but so the world is resetting, but you're not. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See that that's the aspect of roguelikes that I don't like is like you die and then you have to start all over again. 
and but this I wouldn't even call this a roguelike. You you never die. You just run back. You start time over again, and then you go talk to somebody. Like the uh, there's a guy that's gonna kill himself, and that does not trigger an event. But you need information he has, and right. he's about to jump off a cliff as soon as you get there. And so you make it your goal to race and go save him. And when you get there and you talk to him, like if you choose the wrong choice, he jumps, and you go <laughs> crap. Right. All right, I got to go start the cycle over again. Right. And so you, you start the cycle over again, and then you go back, you talk to him again, and you go, blah, 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 and you try a different way of talking to him. And then he decides, he, you get halfway through it, and you go, oh, damn, I chose the wrong choice again. And then he jumps again, and you go, all right, got to restart the cycle again. And it doesn't take long. It's only like five minutes for you to like restart the cycle and run back. But you keep doing it over and over and over again until you do it right. It, it, I, I'm quite enjoying it. And the story is really interesting. It reminds me of the choose your own adventure books from when I was a kid. The, there's a couple of areas where there's combat. Some of the statues come to life and you have to fight them, but it, it it's really simple. Like you point your bow at them and you shoot them and then they turn to gold again. And that's the end of the cycle. The, the, like there's maybe a dozen guys I've shot with an arrow and they turn to gold. And I'm like, all right, that's easy. Uh, it's really a very story-driven game. Every time you meet somebody, you find out some story and you've got to find out some other purpose. So he'll send you to go find this other thing. And so you got to go sneak into a building and find this letter that he needs so that it doesn't... Like, the, the plot is... You, it's lots of dialogue. And all of the dialogue is interesting. That's really cool. Like, it's nice when at least the dialogue is written well and interesting. And I mean, I'm looking at some screenshots on Steam. And it's, I mean, it's a pretty game. It looks fine. It's Skyrim's engine, so it's a it's it's a ten year old engine, but it still doesn't look bad. Uh, it's it's more interesting because of the plot. The plot is one hundred percent why you play this game. And there's a big warning. I mean, I've shared very vague information about what the basic gist of the game is. When you start up the game, they ask you not to stream beyond like there's a midway point in the game. They ask you not to stream beyond that point uh, if you're a streamer, and they also ask you to not share this information on social media because they don't want there's there's like three or four endings i guess in the game right they don't want the ending spoiled because they said if they, you spoil the ending people might not play our game and there's a big warning when you start up the game it says please keep your keep your spoilers vague we don't want people to not play this game and it's just a 20 dollar game on steam i think i got it for 15 on the christmas sale right and i've had a ball with it i've i've probably played like eight nine hours of it and i'm probably about i'd say halfway through it maybe nice it's not old either it came out the end of july last year so it's like six months old yep yep very and, very cool and it's a it's, and it's a good time what's the what's the rating on on steam is it mostly positive it's uh it's like it's like nine out of ten Nice. It's like it, it it it's it's really really well like the writers for it just won an award for their writing. Cool. So, it, it like I said, the the dialogue and like the plot itself is very interesting. And they use a lot of um like a lot of the stuff they talk about is kind of historically relevant. Like it's they like they talk about things that happened in Rome that actually happened in Rome. They talk about uh, they use the right gods, and they, they, at one point, the, the, you're wandering around what's supposed to be a Roman city, but your character makes note, because I picked to be a historian, that a lot of the stuff there is Greek. And so you, the, you end up having conversations with the, the, the people there that are all Roman, and being like, you know, you kind of stole the Greek gods. And they're like, yeah, we know. And like, 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 like it's interesting that you have this kind of dialogue with people. It's nice when games can pull you in like that. Like that's something I remembered about Black Flag, where yeah. I was definitely more interested in the 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 I can't remember his name, but the the pirate guy that you were playing. I followed his story and really enjoyed that. Didn't care so much about the animus like future day stuff. But yeah. it, despite it being old at the time when I was playing it and being new to Assassin's Creed games, like I really got sucked in by the fact that he was a pirate on the run, that he ends up with his own crew and that you had these people that you met along the way and like one person is is not who they seem at first, but then there's also like historical figures that they're taking a spin on, like Blackbeard and stuff like that. And I that kind of stuff is always really, really, really cool. And just like looking at the the screenshots and the choices that you have to make in this, like it, it seems like 
it has all the fun of like time travel episodes from something like Star Trek. Yeah. But that perhaps ex- without the repetition. It, it literally like you do repeat things, but it, it I'm re- it's really clever the way I, I, one of the first things you do you find out when you get there is the magistrate tells you to go talk to this person who's a doctor. It's the first quest they give you as soon as you start the game. And when you find her, someone just died. They've been poisoned. But you're like, well, if they've been poisoned, how come it didn't break the golden rule? Why is why is not everybody turning to gold? So obviously they didn't commit a sin. What is it? And what you end up finding out after talking to people is that the person killed themselves, which is not considered a sin. I was wondering that game. because the guy jumping off the cliff. Right. And so you... So it becomes a goal. And the woman, the the doctor says, yeah, I need this medication to save them, but I can't do it because the guy down the street who's a shop, he wants a thousand, like, uh, like a thousand gold coins or denarii or whatever to, for me to buy that medicine. And that's 10 years worth of work's money. So he's just being a jerk because he can. And so I went in and I robbed his store and I stole all his money. And started the cycle over again. And then I went back to him and I said, hey, give me that medicine. And he goes, I want a thousand gold. And you're like, here, shut up. Right. And and that's literally your dialogue. The first time you try to like bargain with him and there is no bargaining with him. And then the second time you're like, here's your thousand gold. Shut up. Like he's like, how would you know I want a thousand gold for it? And you're like, forget that. Just give me. Right. And like it speeds you through things. And then you give the medicine to her and she cures the lady. And the next cycle when you meet the farmer guy, you hand him the medicine because you still have it in your inventory. And you're like, hey, so-and-so is poison. Give them this. And he's like, wait, how do you know? And you're like, forget how I know. Just go do it now. She's going to die. He goes, okay. And he runs off. And apparently that's part of the cycle is you start giving that guy chores that you were, you figured out the way to fix things and you send him to go talk to people and stuff. And I'm like, that's a really good way to fix the problem of redoing the same day. Right. Also, there's that satisfaction of if that guy's being a dick and you just, you know that you can time travel and then they don't, then you can just, like you said, rob them. And then the next time they try to go through this haggling, you know, spiel, you can, you can just kind of cut through it, fool him, give him his own thousand, you know, money back, uh, and then, and then move on. And so there's this sense of like, winning, you know, like there's the sense of you've defeated, not the puzzle, but like, the dickhead NPC, you know, yep. that would just be frustrating <laughs> to anybody else. There's two other characters that are like slaves and they're trying to buy back their freedom. And so I stole, and at some point you give them the money so they can buy their freedom back because you've been stealing from people. So you're like, here, here's the money you need. Go buy your freedom. And I'm like, I'm like, that's kind of cool. Like, like the fact that like I'm breaking the rules to break the game. Right. Yeah. It, and, it, self-referential in a, in a different kind of way yeah and so i've had a really good time with it to the point where erica is watching me play this and she's like so the baby's gone to bed are you gonna play a game now and i'm like yes i'm gonna play my game that's cool like it's really cool when it's it's engaging enough that it's not just a bunch of running around and butt mashing but there's a story yep. and a plot so that more than the person playing can actually partake and and enjoy it right that's, i i like games like that i think they're um they they don't get as no, enough recognition often no, no, they get, they often get complained that they're not games, but I, 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 I beg to differ. Yeah. So the Forgotten City on Steam, for folks wondering about uh, Canadian prices, it's uh, $29 in, in Canada. Um, but yeah. I would imagine probably something that goes on sale whenever Steam has its, has its sales. Yeah. It, it, it came out in July. It's been on sale two or three times and Christmas was the cheapest it's been. I think it was 15, 15 American. So the other big thing that I took in this week was finally watching Raya and the Last Dragon on Disney Plus. It's been out forever. Uh and I've had it on my watch list forever, but I just I've had other things or I just wasn't in the mood. Uh and I am really, really glad that I did because it does not get enough recognition. Um I don't think enough people were talking about this. And I normally hear about these kind of things with, you know, lots of friends being animators and whatnot. I think maybe it just it could have been the release date being um, like mid pandemic, uh, and kind of like the, the Disney plus kind of paywall stuff. Um, but I, 
I really think more people should check out this film, especially if you have like young women in the family. Um, because technically Ray is a princess, but it's also a fantasy post-apocalyptic story. So there's no yep. dresses, there's no balls, there's none of that nonsense. Uh, it's very kind of, in a lot of ways, it's off center for what Disney normally does. But uh, when it breaks out of those tropes, it does it very, very well. Um, the acting and the screen presence for the two main female characters, uh, Rhea, voiced by Kelly Marie, Marie Tran from Star Wars, uh, and uh, Namari is voiced by Gemma Chan. They're both strong-willed, strong physically. So like they've got swords and bows and axes and like they, they hold their own. They need no one. Uh, and they really steal the, the thunder when they're on screen. Like nothing really matters when either or both Rhea and Namari are on screen. And to kind of set it up, um, and I'll, I'll keep away from spoilers, but I mean, like it's a Disney movie. It's a happy ending, surprising no one. Um, but Kamandra is this name of this magical land. Think of it like, you know, the world, like Pangea. Um, and it's eventually ravaged by Drun, which are basically like evil clouds. They, they're basically like evil spirits that turn people into stone. And what's really interesting, the first time you see it, it's not just that, it's not like Medusa in, in, in mythology where you get turned to stone in the pose that she saw you in. Uh, as the drone passes over someone and turns them into stone, they're turned into like a statue in prayer that everyone is in the exact same position, very straight upright with two hands kind of like held out in front of their chest, um, uh, crossed over one another, kind of like an offering. So like you can put things in the hands and that's what people do. If you, if you've lost loved ones or whatever, you can put small things like flowers or trinkets or something in that person's hand as a way to remember them. Um, and, and that's the main plot of the story is that the Droon had been uh, defeated by all the dragons in the world fighting off the Droon down to the last five or six dragons. They combined all of their magic into the dragon stone and then magically removed all of the Droon. Um, but in doing so, uh, all the dragons were gone. And so the, the right. humans were left on their own. And segregated, like because of this this um, division in people and the battles and the and and stuff, everybody lives in a different area of Kumadra, and it's all named after part of a dragon. Because if you look at the map, it looks like a dragon. The river looks like a dragon. Right. So you've got fang, you've got spine, you've got claw or talon, uh, and then tail. Uh, so there's all these different areas, and the idea is that through time and selfishness and um, self-preservation and all this kind of stuff, the people, the different tribes don't trust one another. And so Rhea's father has the dream of reuniting Kumandra. And so he invites everybody to Heart, which is the, the center of the, the, the world, in the hopes that everybody's going to, you know, get along and, and try to live as one colony. What ends up happening is that the people from Fang mislead both Rhea and, um, and her father. I can't remember his name right now. Um, and that's where um, Namari comes in. Namari is the Fang princess. And right. um, I think it's Fang. And anyway, um, so she betrays Rhea. So they're enemies for most of the movie. Uh, and... Rhea is looking for the last dragon because um, it was her people's job, the people of heart, to guard the, the, uh, the dragon gem. And they failed. Right. So she's trying to collect all the pieces of the dragon gem uh, because when the dragon gem is, is shattered by this betrayal, the Droon come back. So now everybody is back into this, um, this post-apocalyptic world. Uh, at the time, Rhea looks to be about 10 or 12. And then fast forward to like, she's around, around like late teens, early twenties sort of deal. So it's been like five to 10 years, um, since the, the, the falling out. So the whole world is like post-apocalyptic. It's very dangerous to be outside your walls. There's drone everywhere. And Rhea is, is traveling the countryside looking for, um, these dragon gems. And she encounters friends along the way. So then you get into like the typical Disney stuff of like, she's got a band of friends. There's a big guy. There's a bunch of little guys that are silly. 
you know, there's the, the kid, uh, and then there's the dragon who she, she eventually finds and they have to travel the world and try and, um, use the dragon's magic to fix everything. And the two things that stood out for me as, as the biggest kind of pluses is that there's no love interest, even amongst her band of friends, they love one another in the end, but there, there's no romantic interest for Rhea. None. Right. Her love for her dad and her, and her desire to see her father's dream come true, but also just bring him back is her base motivation as a character. And then Namari wants to make her mother proud and Fang are, they're not evil people. They're not, it's not a typical Disney villain either. That's not in, in the, in the show or in the movie. The Droon are the bad guys, but that's just like the Droon represent evil human nature. Not right. like there's not some wizard twirling mustache, like villain. There's no Jafar. Right. And, and so Namari wants to make her mother proud, but also wants to undo the mistake that Fang made because really their selfish actions are the reason that the whole world is dealing with the Droon again. Right. And so she wants to fix that, but she also wants to, you know, save her people and impress her mom. And so she, while having a very blunt and blunt instrument approach to everything does have good intentions. So she's not evil per se, but because of the past friction, Namari and Rhea are like oil and water. Like they do not like one another. Namari is chasing Rhea for most of the movie. So the moral of the film is about trust and the leap of faith required. Uh, to put your best foot forward and trust by your good gesture that other people, even if historically they have been misled and selfish, will see your selfishness or sorry, your selfishless action and follow your lead. And that's, that's the throughput of it. And they do a really good job in the writing and the presentation and the fact that it doesn't follow a lot of Disney tropes. Um, it's really, really well done. There are some fantastic action sequences. The fight between um, Rhea and Namari, like the climactic battle, like these two women hold their own. Like it is awesome to watch the, um, I can't remember. I think Namari has like twin swords yeah. and everything kind of has like a, a Chinese inspired kind of like look to it. Like it looks like a samurai sword, which I know is Japanese, but like it, it looks like a, a uh, an Asian sword, or it looks like a yep. curly blade or like they have all these kind of things. Rhea's sword turns into like a grappling hook. Like it's got all this kind of fantasy element to it. So it's not meant to be like super historical and everything just kind of feels cool. And then, uh, Rhea has this like iconic, like wide brimmed kind of hat. And, and so when she's standing alone in any of these big sweeping shots, like she looks very iconic and the, the two of them go at it and it is aggressive and fast and really well choreographed, but then also they layer in the complicated emotions that both of the characters are bringing to the fight. So they're not just fighting one another because the other one is the bad guy. It's because there's a giant misunderstanding and they're not taking the time to talk and figure out that they both actually want the same thing, which is saving the world right? It, it's the selfishness of they both want the credit for saving the world or Numari wants the credit and Rhea just wants to save her dad, screw the world, right? And it, it like saving the world is just a byproduct of bringing her father back. And that like all those kind of things add to the action and the excitement. Um, Tuk Tuk is uh, the giant armadillo that you likely saw in the trailers voiced by Alan Tuduk, by the way, he doesn't actually say anything. He just kind of makes animal noises, which I think is kind of funny. Um, but, I've seen him do that for a couple of movies now. So, um, this is something I picked up on TikTok, which I didn't realize, you know, how John Ratzenberger is like the, the odd character yep. in like every Pixar every, movie. Yep. Every Disney feature film has got Alan Tudyk in it. Sometimes I'm it's a speaking, surprised. sometimes it's a speaking role. Like in, in, in frozen, he's like one of the magistrates in the town or something like that. He's not a nice guy in frozen, but then the rest of the films, he's like some character somewhere doing either a funny voice or he's, he's a non-speaking like animal kind of grunts make it's a person and needs to have a personality, but it's not verbal. Um, and right. this giant armadillo thing that starts off as like a little thing, the size of a kitten and eventually is like horse size that she rides around on because it tucks itself into a ball and rolls like a motorcycle. 
it creates some incredibly fun chase scenes and like running from Droon and chasing bad guys and and the bad guys like the the fang people they all ride around on giant cats like he-man like it's the imagination behind the show behind the 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 film is really really well done uh the only thing that i would say are the detractors are um while sisu the magical dragon that is raya's companion and and key to unlocking all the magic in the world and saving the day is a cool idea and animated beautifully uh voiced by aquafina takes me out of it immediately Mm-hmm. I, you know, like I, I, I don't like to necessarily single out specific actors, but she's just, it's one of those, it's like, you might as well have the dragon voice by Gilbert Godfrey. The only thing that you're going to think about <laughs> is Gilbert Godfrey the entire time. Right. Like when you, you don't, it, it's not like, like I had to look up who Raya was. I didn't recognize her voice. Same thing with, with, um, with Numari. I had to look up the IMDB for who voiced the characters. Uh, and like other characters, uh, like, um, I think it's Gerald Wong. I can't remember his full name. Um, he's in, he's the guy from, um, from, uh, Dr. Strange. He voices the big, um, Benedict Wong, sorry. Um, Benedict Wong voices Tong, who is like a giant Mongolian looking warrior guy. So like spot on. And the moment he opens his mouth, you're like, that's Benedict Benedict Wong, (laughs) you know? Uh, so that's fine. But, but Aquafina is not funny. Um, I feel like she's sort of off script half the time. Like I, I don't enjoy her presentation and as this regal looking magical dragon, having this awkward kind of like fast talking, uh, uh, actress take on the voice. It it just really didn't fly for me. Uh, it's, it's like they wanted to recreate what they captured with Eddie Murphy as Mushu in Mulan and they missed the mark incredibly See, um I, i've heard very mixed things on this movie so it and i don't think it did well for disney in theaters um no i don't so, think it did either so the interesting thing is is now that this is out on disney plus uh have you heard of turning red the new pixar movie yes yeah with uh, the red panda yeah yeah uh th- the r- the last i heard is that's going to be a direct to disney plus release now Hmm. Interesting. So, or, or that what that was what I heard the other day. I don't know if it's true, but if true, it it it, it uh, yeah, it's going straight to Disney Plus. That was the news two days ago. And I, so I like that idea better. Like I I don't uh, want me, the the wait. You know. Yeah, the, I, I'm very much of a. Uh, I don't want to go to the theater. Uh, I, I'll stream. Uh, I will say I saw the new Spider-Man movie. It's excellent. Go see it if you can. If not, wait for it to stream. Like yeah. don't like like, but is stream it as soon as you can. It's really good. But uh, it, and and I had a fun time going to the theater. But I'd much rather watch this stuff at home. I there are some things like Spider-Man that I am bummed that I have not gone and probably won't go to the theater. Uh, I missed Eternals in the theater. Same thing. I would have loved to have seen that in the theater, but I just, it's not a strong enough draw for me with COVID-19 to add to something I don't need to do in public. Um, now I've had reports from around here. Like, I think, I think Alistair went to go see Spider-Man and he think he said he was one of six people in the entire theater. So like in a sparse population like Nova Scotia, the few people that are going to the theaters, you're probably going to be very far away from other people and really not much of a risk but for whatever reason it just feels frivolous to me um our theater at... was full really wow why uh, was it like, like it was like it was like two chairs between everybody or between every group was about the way it was right but it was like but it was literally like the it, it was a lot of people in that theater yeah that would have made me uncomfortable i i don't think that i would have i would have wanted that you know, I would have sat and watched the movie, but I, it would have been like, it would have soured the experience a little bit. Cause I would have been uncomfortable with that many people mm-hmm. around. It was, a, it was assigned seating. So when Erica picked our seats, she picked the spot that looked like there was nobody there and we were pretty much, there was nobody around us, Right. but the, all the center seats, it was like three people, two seats, two empty seats, three more people, two empty seats. And, and Erica was like, yeah, I put us on the other side away from yeah. where the group was to watch the movie. So. So the budget for 
uh, Raya and the Last Dragon. I, I keep on saying Raya. It's Raya. It's pronounced Raya, even though it's spelled R-A-Y-A. Um, but the budget was $100 million and the box office was $130.3 million. So while it made money, not Disney numbers by success in terms of any, any comparison um, for animated films and whatnot. Um, but I, like I said, underrated, uh, I would encourage people to, to see it, especially now that it's beyond any paywall. It's just part of the regular Disney plus offerings. Um, the only other small complaints I had about it were some of the things that I think were typical Disney. Like there's a little character that's a baby. She's an infant and she's like a ninja and she has these little ongi monkey, like sidekicks. Yep. And they're basically like the non-speaking goofy, shake my fist at you, annoying lead character and then does whatever they want kind of mischievous stuff they're funny but the fact that it was a baby really took me out of it uh if it was all kung fu monkeys and they happen to have a leader it would have been way more believable kind of like uh nico from yeah pocahontas like that kind of stuff yeah. um but because it was a toddler it made no sense because it's like there's no way that a kid can do this like the baby was crawling and then they're doing like kung fu flips off of buildings and stuff and I get that it's a fantasy world and I'm looking at dragons and creatures like armadillos that you can ride. And like, I, I get that. But for whatever reason, the fact that there was a human in it, it kind of broke that, that Disney um, border of like people are people in Disney films, but then animals have people personalities, but they're still animals, right? They'll still right. do people things, but they'll, they'll, they're give, they're driven by their animal instincts. Right. And so the monkeys were pickpockets and it made sense. But you don't know why this kid was a pickpocket. I think eventually they reveal that her parents were turned to stone. So she was an orphan and the monkeys basically took her in. But like, how are you supposed to figure that out and justify it? Unless like a character tells you because the script says so, right? Like, so it's not, it's not, right. a, not a strong part. Um, they do tie it together a little bit later where Tong has lost his entire family, including his child to the Droon. And so he takes quickly to, I think her name is Noi a little baby. So this great big burly warrior guy takes to the infant because he's lost a child to the Darun. So it kind of, it does illustrate like the level of everyone is affected by the Darun. Uh, and there's obviously some, um, some parallels between real world stuff, but it doesn't smack you in the face. It's not like a movie about a pandemic. Right. Um, right. And what I like about it is that the Darun, it's evil magic brought about and fed by um basically people behaving badly so like if you're mistrustful or you know if you're or if you're selfish or if you're you know causing harm or um blaming people for things like that's the kind of thing that feeds the drone right um the other right. thing that i thought was a misstep was at the very end slight spoiler again they saved the day and they saved the world um but the whole time Sisu has been talking about her dragon brothers and sisters. And every time they find a piece of the dragon stone and Sisu touches it, she gets a new magical power. And she goes, oh, this is my brother's power or this is my sister's power. And so she's talking about all of her dragon brothers and sisters. And they're talked up the entire film. And at the end, right. all, the, all the dragons come back and you never get to meet her brothers and sisters. You see them. They smile at her. There's no speaking. There's nothing. And I think it was a real missed opportunity to iron out the rough edges because Sisu has some moments, like there are some very magical, very emotional moments with Sisu where you do sort of like slide away from the Aquafina voice and you just realize it's more of a, R a Raya Sisu moment. But to, to cement the fact that these dragons are regal and world changing and, and life saving and and all these kind of mystical qualities, I feel like they needed some sort of like moment where the dragons kind of like sit down and thank everyone for coming together or they're just, you needed to have some sort of like confirmation that these magical dragons that have just been brought back into the world are not voiced by Ryan Reynolds, Danny DeVito and the rock, right? Like, you, you know, you yeah. want them to sound a little bit more regal or, or, or just something. Uh, and, and they, they just don't get there. It's just a visual thing. It's, it's like that long roll music swelling and then boom, music title or film title. And that's the end of the movie. So, it, I mean, it was good, but it was, it felt you like you wanted to know a lot more about the world. 
Moving on into the Internet Minute, which is, of course, brought to you by you, dear listener. The Siddle Cafe is 100% listener supported. If you're getting value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. Become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member only Discord server. And other benefits include website credit thanks and, of course, bonus episodes when they get recorded, usually about once a month. Patron count is at 23, which is steady on from last week. If you'd like to be patron number 24, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. I'm going to keep mine short and sweet this week. I have been keeping an eye on CES and have been not really overwhelmed by much. Uh, A lot of stuff seems to be kind of expected. A lot of curved monitor screens and stuff that I don't care about. However, Hydroloop is a project that is uh, in-home water recycling. It's an appliance that takes roughly 80% or 85% up to 85% of your water from things like uh, washing machines, stuff you go put down the drain when you're washing your dishes, basically like wastewater in your house that's not sewage, so not like not your toilet, and runs it through a six-step maintenance-free purification system. Then you can use that water again to wash dishes, flush your toilet, Uh, wash your laundry, water your garden, all that kind of stuff. And what I thought was so interesting about it is that it's an in-home appliance that is roughly the size of a refrigerator in terms of height and width. But as far as depth, it's like a small pantry. It only looks to be about eight inches deep. I could be a little bit off on that, but it's easily only about a quarter as deep as a fridge. So not something you're necessarily going to put in your kitchen, but it's certainly not going to look out of place in a basement or in like a utility room, like next to your water heater and your furnace and all that kind of stuff, even in your laundry room, which is where the website tends to show it. Uh, it does not take up very much room. Your washer and dryer take up way more room than this thing would. Uh, and so Hydroloop is the name of the company. We'll have a link to, uh, hydroloop.com and the, in the show notes. And I just, I just think it's cool. And it's the kind of thing where you'd probably have to be in a certain price range to afford it as a personal household, but their clients are like, oh, you're building a new apartment building. You should put one of these either on every floor or in every house. Or if you're developing a, 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 a community, like you're building a bunch of houses, you should put all of these in the houses because then as the community kind of like spans the area, you're just going to have that much less water usage in that area. And so by recycling the water in the house, it reduces the amount of water that you have to bring in fresh. And that, so you're basically just bringing in fresh water to like drink and cook with and, and stuff like that. And I, I think it's phenomenal. It's a really cool product. Neat idea. Uh, I, I think it makes more sense for new homes rather than old homes. I fi- find it would probably be difficult to add to old homes. Yeah, I guess it would depend on where and how organized your plumbing is, right? Like if everything kind of comes into or leaves out of the house around the same area, um, like for me around here, I know a lot of houses that have like basements and then they usually have what we around here collectively call the furnace room, right? And that would yep. be the same place where people would have their washer dryer sometimes, or they would have uh, their deep freeze. Uh, and some of the houses that I grew up in, it's where we kept our deep freeze and all of our wood for our, our fire burning stove. And it's also where my dad had, he was making wine in that area too. So like there would be room for places like that. But again, like, I don't know what the output would be if you want it to be used to flush toilets and, um, run through other places. Like you'd have to know, like, where's your hose hookup for outside, um, they do look like they're inside appliances, not outside appliances, though. I don't know for sure. Um, right. it might not matter in warmer climates, but in the Northern hemisphere, chances are they're probably more inside stuff. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, but yeah, again, they look, they look really cool. What is your pick this week, sir? My pick is just remind people something that I almost forgot today. Uh, Eternals is now out on Disney plus. So if you didn't go to the theater, like I didn't, you can now watch it. I now have something to watch over dinner. Fantastic. Good luck. It's two and a half hours long, I think. Dinners. Dinners. <laughs> That's the other thing that I can't do uh, or I like about uh, streaming movies from home is I, I can watch them in more than one sitting. I don't have to sit mm-hmm. there for the full the full two and a yep. half hours. Um, but that's good because I'm I've been looking forward to that. And uh, I've been hard on social media. I've been avoiding. I see a lot of Spider-Man spoilers now. Uh, especially on platforms like TikTok, where they don't warn you. They just kind of say in this clip and you're looking at the thing that's happening. You're like, ah, darn it. Like I really didn't want to see that, you know? And so the spoiler veil is being slowly lifted on Spider-Man has been out for almost a month now. So I need to either find a way to watch it or hopefully they'll, 
I mean, it's probably doing so well in theaters that they're not going to pull it anytime soon, but I really want to watch it um, before I get spoiled on some of the bigger moments. Um, but I will definitely be adding Eternals to my list. That wraps up this episode of the Sizzle Cafe. You can get more information about the show and some of the links that Lou and I talked about at the sizzlecafe.com. Music for the show is composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email us at the sizzlecafe at gmail.com. Thanks again, Dan, for the great email. Follow the show by name on Twitter and subscribe for free on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, really wherever you can find a podcast, you can find the Sizzle Cafe. Spread the word, tell a friend because we'd like to grow the audience. So just let them know that they can not only listen, but they can also support the show on Patreon and help us make more podcasts. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything that I am up to online, including my illustration and design portfolio at joelduggan.com. You can check out my other podcast all about Minecraft at the spawnchunks.com. And you can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I am back streaming from the Citadel, the Minecraft server that I play every weekend, doing some cool stuff in a medieval city. And we set up a new 118 zone. So Minecraft got updated uh, just before the holidays. There's all kinds of cool mountains and caves. And now we have an area specific on the Citadel for that. And I'll be exploring that hopefully in the coming weeks on the stream. So check us out on Twitch. It's a lot of fun. Lou, where can people find you online? The easiest place to find me is looking up The Busy Zombie Lord on all the social media that matters. And you can check out my show, Zombies in My Podcast, where we're going to talk about zombies in the new year. You've been listening to The Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two.